So we're talking about empowering relationships, building empowering relationships, starting a new series today. You know, a lot of people have been um, asking me lately and, and saying, Lord, uh, if, uh, or Pastor, would you teach us how to reach out and, and make relationships uh, with others in a natural and a non-threatening way? It, it's amazing how in this 21st century, there's so much stuff going on that it's, it's difficult to break through some of the social barriers. And, and so how do we make relationships? And, you know, and, and maybe, one of, maybe one or two of our parents said, you know, you shouldn't talk to strangers. And the problem with that is everyone's a stranger the first time you meet. So who on earth do you talk to, right? Going to school, oh, no, the teacher's a stranger today. Can't talk to them. You know, I can't go into the church. Oh, that's, I don't know that pastor. Can't talk to him. Who do you talk to, right? Or maybe the better way to say it is how do we discern who the safe people are so we can build relationships with them? Is there a way to evaluate who the safe people are? And, and, and thankfully there is. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But, um, you know, most people want relationships that are beneficial and healthy and empowering but they struggle. How do I build a relationship? How do I then nurture the relationship? How do I maintain the relationship when conflicts come? Because you can stick this on your refrigerator as a, as a promise of God. Relation, conflicts will come, right? They just, they just will. And how do we get through the misunderstandings and the, the personality conflicts and whatever? There is a way, okay? God wants us to have relationships, so we, there is a way. So in the spirit, in this series, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at God's purpose for relationships. Okay, we're going to look at God's purpose for relationships. We're going to learn how to discern who those safe people are that we can build relationships with, and then we're going to learn how to start relationships, build relationships, nurture relationships, and maintain relationships. Right? We'll go through. If you're going to go through all the work to build a friend, let's keep them. Right? Let's not lose those that we, 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 we find as friends. Okay? So we're going to start with uh, God's primary purpose for relationships. Okay? <coughs> there is a primary purpose for relationships. But before we can even understand God's primary purpose for relationships, um, well, I should say because the reason we need to know God's primary purpose for relationships is that if we don't know his purpose for relationships, we may end up building on the wrong foundation, or we may end up having relationships for the wrong reason, and then we're going to be disappointed when things don't go the way we want them to go, okay? Or we could even be hurt by the very relationships that God meant for us to be blessed by, okay? So, how do we, I should say, what is God's primary purpose for relationship? Well, we where do we go? We go to the beginning of the Bible and find out that Genesis chapter 2 and 3 tells us God's purpose for relationships. But before we even look at that, we have to look at God's original assignment for us as human beings because that ties into our purpose for relationships, okay? <coughs> so, God's assignment or assignments, there's really two for mankind, okay? And uh, I'm going to give you the title, but then I'll explain it, okay? Our assignment in the kingdom is to cultivate and protect, okay? The verse is Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Okay, God, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it, okay? That, that word Eden, or the, the Garden of Eden, the word Eden means pleasure and or delight or it means three things. It means pleasure, delight, and delicate, okay? So God created a special place on earth that he called the Garden of Eden, basically the Garden of Pleasure, the Garden of Delight. And, and, and he placed, right, placed, he took the man and he put him in the garden. He placed mankind in the garden to be able to grow and to thrive and to fulfill God's purpose, okay? It was a place where... The God's kingdom was to be established, okay? That was, he put him in the garden to, be, to establish God's kingdom. So in essence, the Garden of Eden was like a biosphere of God's kingdom or a beachhead of God's kingdom. He said, go into the garden, start to uh, uh, establish my rule in the garden and basically then advance it and grow it, okay? And so everything that was in the garden was to be 
was to submit to the will and rule of God. So the garden became the biosphere or the place where God's kingdom was to be birthed and developed, okay? <clears throat> but as the word suggests, the word Eden also means delicate, okay? Um, it was a place that was delicate, so it needed to be protected. And, and if we've read Genesis, we realize why it needed to be protected. Now, that word cultivate, it says, uh, where is it here? Took, uh, did I went the wrong way? Cultivate, okay, sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay, it said to work in the garden. He, Adam had two things to do in the kingdom, in the garden. Number one, he had to work. That word work means to work or to serve or to cultivate. So it wasn't about just slaving in the garden. It was about actually cultivating and causing the garden to thrive, okay? His first assignment in the garden was to serve the garden and keep it healthy and growing. That's why Adam was put there. The other word it said is that uh, Adam was to take care of the garden, but that word take care means to guard, to protect, to attend, to preserve, to save, and to watch, okay? So what, the, the, what, 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 see, mankind's second assignment in the garden was to actually guard the garden, nurture it, right, and develop it, but then to protect it. Protect it from whom? Well, Satan, demons, uh, evil, all these things, right? And so he was called, Adam, mankind was called to, to cultivate the garden, at, but then also protect the garden from all these negative things that came into the garden. And, and so our job today is still the same. We're called to cultivate the kingdom of God and to protect the kingdom of God. Cultivate the church and to protect the church, okay? Our jobs, our assignment has not changed in the thousands of years since God said that. Still, it says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard. Okay? Stand firm in your faith. Be men and women of courage. Be strong. Why? Because we need to protect what God wants to establish in his church and in his kingdom. We're called to nurture and to protect. That's our job. Our assignment from God for, all of, for, for mankind, for his children in the kingdom is to cultivate and to protect, and it's never changed, okay? Now, what about our assignment to the world? We have an assignment not only in the kingdom, but also in the world around us, those that are not yet in the kingdom, the area that's not yet under God's rule, and the assignment is to overcome and advance, and I'll show you that with these words, okay? Genesis chapter 126, then God said, let them rule over the fish. You ever think about that? How do you rule a fish? You ever tried to rule a fish? Like it's, like, so, so God was trying to say something and we didn't get it at first, okay? Yeah. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, rule over all the earth, and over all the creatures over all the creatures that move on the ground. Somebody started moving on the ground in Genesis chapter 3 that they needed to rule over, and they didn't, okay? Okay, so um, that word rule, interestingly, and again, means to tread down, to subjugate, to have dominion over, to prevail against. So God is saying that in the world, mankind, in the world, children of God, you need to take dominion or prevail against those creatures that seem to be enemies of the kingdom. Okay? Okay. So, um, see, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is good. So, um, we discover later that those creatures that were to prevail against, to have dominion over, to rule over, actually those demonic forces of wickedness in the world around us, okay? Okay? And, and that's why God said you need to subjugate against them, to prevail against them, to reign over them, okay? He wasn't talking about reigning over fish and subjugating fish. He was talking about those creatures, let's go back to it, um, over all the earth, those creatures that are moving around in the earth today that are against the kingdom of God and we need to uh, prevail against them. They're the enemies of the kingdom, demonic forces, humanistic thinking, all of those things that are against God's kingdom. And so mankind had, we'll go back to it here, to prevail against 
the wicked spiritual forces on the earth. That was part of our assignment in the world. Not in the church, because in the church there shouldn't be any of that anyway. Because if we protect the church and nurture it properly, there shouldn't be any of that in the, in the church. So in the world, though, there's wicked spiritual forces. Okay. And again, our, our um, assignment has never changed. Ephesians 6.12 our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, Against the powers of this dark world, right? Those creatures that are moving on on the ground today, trying to come against God's rule and God's uh, will on the earth today. Okay, So that's part of our assignment to the world, okay? We have assignment in the church, in the kingdom, right? To protect and to cultivate, but we all have, so have an assignment in the world today. Okay, so second assignment, or second part of the assignment to the world, Genesis 1:28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, okay? Be fruitful. So God's given us another assignment, just to be fruitful in what we do, not to sit on our seat and relax and do nothing and you know, stay up on days of our lives or whatever. Or if, you know, whatever. It, it's a form of artwork. I guess we have to live with it. But let's be fruitful. Okay, let's take the time to honor God in our lives and be fruitful. That word fruitful means to bear fruit. Duh. <laughs> to bring forth fruit, to be fruitful, to grow, to increase, to cause to be fruitful, or even to make others fruitful. Okay? So part of bearing fruit is not only to us bear fruit in our lives, but to help other people become fruitful in their lives. Okay? So important. Okay? So, so important. Okay. Uh, so we were not called to just sit and relax. We were called to be fruitful and help others become fruitful. And again, God's will has never changed. Our assignment has never changed. John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Okay? Every person is called to serve God in the world and to bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Okay? Another part of our assignment to the world is, there we go, to increase God's kingdom on earth. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Okay, increase in number. Now, again, this is important because a lot of people see increase in numbers. So, oh, yeah, that means have lots of babies. Um, well, it's true. That's part of increasing in number. But the Hebrew word, that's translated increase in number, means to increase in any respect, okay? To bring in abundance, to enlarge, to excel, to be full of, to make great, to yield much, or to multiply, okay? So, um, so this verse isn't just talking about having children, okay? Yes, it's ta it, it, this verse is talking about increasing God's kingdom on the earth, okay? In the world, right, in the church or in the kingdom, we're called to cultivate and protect. In the world, we're called to increase God's kingdom, okay? And how do we do that? Yes, we do that by having godly babies and raising godly children, but also by raising up godly spiritual children, and also through enlarging or increasing uh, the righteousness of God's kingdom on this earth, right? Wherever we go, we're to carry God's righteousness and God's justice wherever we go, okay? And again, God's will has never changed. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. God fully expects that as long as there are Christians on this earth, God's government, God's kingdom, God's rule will be increasing and increasing and increasing because that's part of our assignment in the world, wherever you go, you take the kingdom. To work, to school, to your neighborhood, wherever you go, you take the kingdom. Okay, that's why we're teaching you to get the school of the spirit, to help you to take the kingdom wherever you go. Okay. Another part of our assignment to the world, to fill the earth with God's kingdom. Not just to increase it, increase it until it's full. Okay, Genesis 1.28 God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. Fill the earth, okay? To fill means to fill, to accomplish, right? To accomplish God's assignment. 
to consecrate, to bring consecration of the earth to God, right? To, to, us, to basically bring the earth under, under the rule of God. To fulfill, to overflow, to have holy, okay? To fill the earth with God's kingdom. Okay, we're not only called to increase the kingdom of God on the earth, but also to fill the earth with God's kingdom, okay? Um, through our word, through our ministry, uh, through our lifestyle, wherever we go, we're called to carry the kingdom until that, wherever we are, that place is filled. And we keep filling every place God takes us. Eventually, the whole world is filled with the kingdom of God, okay? And again, God's will has never changed. Our assignment, Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the, God, of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. Now that's a lot of glory of the God, of the Lord, glory of the Lord. That's a lot of knowledge of the glory of the, word of the Lord. And of course we know the word knowledge there is the experiential knowledge. They would have an experiential knowledge, not just so, oh, the, we understand that God has glory. But no, they would have an experiential knowledge uh, knowledge of the glory of God. They would experience it in their own lives, right? Wherever we go, people should be experiencing the glory of God. Um, and so our assignment has not changed. There, God expects us to keep carrying the kingdom until the whole world is full of the knowledge of the glory of God, the experiential knowledge, okay? One last part of our assignment to the world is to bring everything under God's rule, Okay? Genesis 128, last time, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, okay? That word subdue means to tread down, to conquer, to subjugate, to subdue, to bring into subjection, to bring into submission to the rule of God, okay? So God wants everything to be brought under the rule of God. Now, again, when you look at those words, you say, oh, this sounds very violent. This means, this sounds almost like militant. But no, we're talking about submitting everything to the will of God, which is good, good will, right? He wants everything to be submitted to his love. He wants everything to be submitted to his peace. He wants everything to be submitted to his joy. Because the kingdom of God is, not, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when we submit things to the kingdom of God, we're submitting to God's righteousness, peace, and joy. So this is good subjugation. This is good bringing in subjection. To, like, to be conquered by love is a wonderful thing, right? Okay, this is a good thing. Okay. So, um, so our assignment is wherever we go is to bring every culture under the submission of the will of God, the rule of God. And again, God's will has not changed. Romans 14, 11. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. There will be a day when every tongue will confess to God that Jesus is Lord uh, to, the, to the glory and praise of God. Okay? So, um, God has assigned us the task of bringing every culture under his rule. Okay? And he expects there will come a day when certainly every knee will bow. Our knees hopefully have already bowed. Eventually he wants every knee to bow to his rule, his rule of love. Okay? Okay. So, I went through that quickly because that's really not the point of this message, but it's the foundation we need to understand that, that God has given us mankind, his children, an assignment. When he created man and woman, right, the word man in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and 3 is the word Adam, which literally means mankind. Not male, but mankind. So he made mankind, male and female, in his image for two assignments. Our assignment in the kingdom is to cultivate and protect. Cultivate the kingdom of God, cultivate the church, and protect it from the evil, from the, the, the worldliness, all these negative things, right? But then we also, each one of us in this room, also has an assignment in the world, and that's to overcome and advance. In the world, we're called to overcome Satan, we're, overcome, we're called to overcome injustice, evil, the evil forces, the wicked wicked powers of this world overcome and advance the kingdom, okay? That's our two assignments, okay? It's very easy. One assignment in the, in the kingdom, cultivate and protect. One assignment in the world to overcome and advance, okay? And so, now there, there, there can be 
many expressions of that assignment, right? There are many ways to cultivate and protect. You may be involved in Sunday school ministry. You may be involved in teaching ministry. You may be involved in worship ministry. There are many ways to cultivate and protect. But that's our assignment, to cultivate and protect in the kingdom and to overcome and advance. And again, there's many ways to overcome and advance in the world as evangelists, as pastors, right? As intercessors, as prophetic people. But it's still our assignment. Whatever we're doing, we should see our, the kingdom of God cultivate and protect it and in, 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 in the world the evil overcome and, advan and the kingdom advanced. Okay. Now, why did I lay that foundation? Because God said these things. He gave mankind an assignment, two assignments, one in the kingdom, one in the world. And then the very next thing he said after he gave man, he gave it to mankind, but mankind basically at that moment consisted of Adam. <laughs> okay. All you people, Adam, <laughs> you, like this one person, here's your assignment. And Adam's going, what? Like, how on earth am I going to possibly fulfill this assignment? And God says, well, you know what? It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay? It's not good for me to be alone in his assignment. He's got this assignment. There's no way he can fulfill his assignment alone. Okay? So what do we learn from this statement? Number one, we learn... That God, or God himself said Adam was alone in his assignment. Right? He said it's not good for the man to be alone. There's no way he can fulfill his purpose on this earth alone. Okay? Think about this for a minute. Adam had 24-hour-a-day access to God. Right? He saw God face-to-face. -face. He walked with God. He conversed with God daily. Okay? Uh, they talked face-to-face. -face. They communicated every day about a million different topics, right? They were always discussing, talking together. And yet, after this intimate relationship, this intimacy of communication, then, then God declares Adam was alone, right? Now, he certainly, well, actually, here's the, here's the Hebrew word. Um, Adam was alone. He was separated from a body, from a larger body. That's what alone means. You're separated from a larger body. Uh, you're apart you're only, you're alone, or you're by yourself, okay? And, and so Adam was not alone as a purpose because he had daily communion with God. But he was alone in terms of being able to fulfill the assignment for mankind. He needed help. So God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. He has a big job to do. There's no one here to help him. This is not good. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make a helper. I'm going to make a helper for Adam. Okay? Adam needed helpers to fulfill his assignment. Okay? And that word helper just means uh, an aid, a helper, or one who helps. Right? Okay. Now, it, it, does, it doesn't say here marriage partner. It doesn't say here better half. Right? It just says, I'm going to make Adam someone who can aid him in his assignment. Okay? See, Eve was not created because Adam was lonely and needed someone to talk to. Adam already had someone to talk to, right? He already had someone who was completely intimately involved with in terms of communication and sharing his heart, okay? Adam was, or, I'm sorry, Eve was, not, was also not created because Adam's going, boy, I need to have some sex here. You know, it's like, I'm a man, I need a woman, okay? That's not why, you need to understand this. That's not why God created Eve, because man needed to have a sex partner. No, Eve was created to be an aid or a helper or an equal to help Adam fulfill the assignment for mankind on the earth, right? In the kingdom and in the world, okay? So, um, see, marriage and procreation became the vehicle for creating many more helpers, right? Marriage and procreation became the vehicle for creating a lot more helpers, but Eve was created first and foremost to be a helper, not a spouse, but to be a helper in fulfilling or helping uh, uh, or to, in fulfilling mankind's assignments on the earth, one into the kingdom and one into the world, okay? So, the primary purpose of relationships 
is to help us fulfill our assignments, right? The primary purpose of me having a relationship with Mike Hardigan is not because I'm lonely and I need, you know, a good laugh, a good friend or whatever, right? No, it's because I need him to help me fulfill my assignment, my expression of my assignment, and, I, and he needs me to help him fulfill his expression of his assignments, right? That's why God brings us together, to help us fulfill God's assignments on the earth. So, we need to learn how to make relationships, build relationships, mature relationships, and uh, maintain relationships, not so we don't have to be lonely, but, and not so that we can have a lot of friends on Facebook, okay? Just, just in case you're wondering, right? Okay. It's so that we can help each other in our assignments. So whenever I meet a new person, I'm not thinking, oh boy, maybe this person will fulfill my need for a friend. Whenever I meet a new person, I say in my head, wow, I wonder how I can help that person fulfill their assignment here on this earth. Okay? It totally changes the focus of you having friends, of you having relationships. It's not about you fulfilling your personal needs. It's about you and another person or other people working together to fulfill your assignments on the earth where they can be a blessing to you, but yes, you can be a blessing to them to fulfill God's purpose for your life on this earth. Okay? So, implications. There's a lot of implications to this, but let's just look at a few. Number one, we need to commit our lives to God's assignments. Each person in this room has an assignment. Like it, It's not about how much Bible you know. It's not about how great of a worshiper you are, a great singer you are. You have, we have, each one of us has two assignments on this earth. Expressed in many different ways, but each one of us has two assignments. One in the kingdom to protect and cultivate and one in the world, right? To advance and to overcome. Okay? Advance the kingdom and overcome the evil in the world, okay? So, if our core priority, if our core priority is not to fulfill our assignments in our life, we will miss the mark of why God created us. And we will, as a result, not find the fulfillment that we're looking for because true fulfillment is found in doing the will of God. And so if we try to find, if we try to use relationships for any other purpose than the primary purpose, or make the primary purpose the primary purpose, we will not be fulfilled in our relationships. Yes, there is a time when you're going, I'm in crisis, I need someone to talk to. There is a time when you can say, you know what, I just need to bounce an idea off of somebody. But... If you're only using relationships for that need, you've misused the relationship. Because the primary purpose of relationships is to work together to fulfill our assignments on the earth. Okay. So let's commit to God's assignments for our life in whatever way we're, expressed, we're, we're called to do that. I'm called to fulfill God's assignments as a teacher, as an apostolic leader, as, as, as a mentor, as a spiritual father, as a dad right, in my, in, for my kids, as a husband. Each one of us has different expressions, but those are my two assignments. And I must, again, protect and nurture my family, which is part, which should be part of the kingdom of God if I've done it right, right? Okay. Okay, so the second thing, and, and I, I really want to emphasize this, is that we have to commit to empowering our spouse. See, Remember that Adam was alone. Why was Adam alone? Because there was no one to help him fulfill his assignments. And so God gave him a spouse named Eve. And now both of them had the same assignments, but they would probably express them in different ways, right? Like, hey, if you're married, you know your, your spouse expresses themselves in different ways. They think differently. They, they, they process differently. But... Hopefully, your, your spouse has some common assignments with you. Uh, Pastor Kathy and I are both called to teaching. We're both called to discipleship. We're both called to mentoring. We're both called to be spiritual parents. There's some common expression in our assignments, right? And so if that's the case, if I'm married, the most important thing I can do is love my spouse. 
um, pray for my spouse, um, minister to my spouse, encourage my spouse, and, and discover how she is called to express her assignments and then to help her to do that, right? Because God said it's not good for the human, the man to be alone, the woman to be alone. There needs to be a helper. Why? To fulfill her assignments. Just as she's called to help me fulfill my assignments, I'm called to help her. So if she's down... I shouldn't be running away and say, oh, gee, I hope you feel better, you know, in a couple of days, but I got, I got stuff to do. No, I need to spend time ministering to my spouse because I'm called. God gave me a spouse, Eve. God gave me my Eve to help me as an aid, as a helper together to fill our assignments. The other interesting thing you should know that the word helper there in, uh, in the, in the uh, Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament, the word helper there is the exact same word used to describe the Holy Spirit as our helper. Okay, so, the, so like, uh, like, like our spouse is not our slave. Our spouse is not our servant. We should honor our spouse the same way we honor the Holy Spirit as a partner. Okay, and it's so important to understand. Okay, so we do whatever we can do to serve our partner, to love them, to encourage them, because we're called together to fulfill some assignments on this earth. Okay. So, and, and we're called to see them become successful in fulfilling her, their assignments. So if I'm called to, to do everything I can to make my spouse successful in her assignments, and she's called to do everything she can to make me assi uh, successful in my assignments, guess what? We're both going to be successful. And we're both going to know each other incredibly well. And we're both going to love each other incredibly well. And we're both going to communicate together and pray for one another and walk together, right? How can two walk together unless they agree? Agree in what? Well, agree in their assignments for one thing. Okay? Now, what if you're not married? Well, if you're not married, then I, you know, before you get married, you know, understand what you have two assignments on this earth. And understand how you're called to fulfill those assignments... And then find someone who's also committed to fulfill their assignments. And also find someone who understands how they're called to fulfill their assignments. And then find someone who actually has some of the same expression in fulfilling those assignments. Okay? To understand that together, how can you fulfill your assignments? See, okay, quick story. We got time. I met this uh, couple. Actually, I didn't. I met the, the woman. She was called to... Her assignment was in the church to, to nurture, right, or to uh, cultivate and protect. But she loved children. She absolutely loved children. And so she, um, she, she, she worked with children all the time. She wanted to have a big family. And she met this guy one day, and he was so much in love with her. He honored her because of her heart, her compassion, her care for children, the way she worked with children. And he said, that's the type of woman I want to marry. Okay. Now, this man... He had, he had the same assignment in the church, but he also had an assignment in the world, and he fulfilled his assignment in the world by rescuing people off the street, okay? By taking people who are on the street and bringing them into his home and feeding them and giving them clothes and caring for them. That sounds really good. So she honored him and said, wow, this guy's amazing. He has such a love for people in general. Boy, I sh that's the type of guy I want to marry. So they got married, okay? A week later, she wakes up. There's a strange man on the couch downstairs, who is this man? Oh, well, you know, you know my heart. Like, I love people in the street. I brought in this guy. Well, who is he? I don't know. Is he safe? Well, I don't know, but he's a guy in the street. He needed a place to stay. And so she's now living in fear because she's afraid now her husband's going to bring home somebody every night that may end up killing her in her sleep. She's, like, she's honest. Like, she's got some valid reasons for being concerned. Okay, a couple days later, she wakes up in the morning. There's a woman lying on the couch wearing one of her nightgowns. <laughs> this is a true story, folks. And, and she says, what are you doing here? And he says, well, you know my heart for the lost and, and the heart for the people on the street. And this woman here, I saw her in the street, and she didn't have a place to stay, and she was hungry. I brought her home, and, 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 and I gave her something to eat, and uh, I gave her one of your nightgowns. I knew you wouldn't mind, right? And so um, that, that marriage lasted three months. Why? He was compassionate. He was a Christian. She was compassionate. She was a Christian. But they weren't together in their assignments. And she needed, in order for her to be that nurturing mother who could look after children, she needed a safe place to raise those children. And he would not give her that safe place because he was letting people come into the home every night. And she was scared to death for her life. And, and she said, I'm just going to have children with you. 
And he suddenly said, well, yeah, you're just judgmental. You don't, you know, whatever, all those things. Anyway, see, so that's why I'm saying if you're not married yet, find someone who's committed to your assignments, but also find someone who is a, has the same expression of assignments, at least in some areas of your life. That Kathy and me are so different in so many areas, but we have some common expression of assignments, and we just have so much fun doing those things together, okay? Make sure that whoever you marry has some common expression of assignments, okay? That's a lot more than in my notes, but anyway, that was good. Okay, number three, ensure that some of your relationships care or share a common expression of assignments. What do I mean by that? Um, see, we're always going to have some relationships with people who are not Christians, and that's okay as long as we understand our assignment is to bring them in the kitchen, into the kingdom because our challenge, right, part of our assignment is to advance the kingdom. And we're also going to always have some people in our lives, relationships with people who are Christians but don't yet understand their assignments. And that's okay as long as we understand that part of our calling is to help them understand they have assignments. Because part of our assignment is not only to be fruitful, but to help them become fruitful in what God's called them to do. So that's okay. But it is really, really, really important that in your inner circle of friends, you have some people who not only understand they have the same assignments you do, but they have the, some, of the, some of your friends have the same expression of assignments. Why do I say that? Okay. Well, if you're called... Um, see, remember that God created relationships to help us help each other fulfill our assignments. Okay? And so if one of us is called to, an, to be an evangelist, and, and, and on all of our other relationships, though, all of our friendships are called to some other ministry, we're probably not going to be doing too much evangelism because we're going to be pulled into their interests instead, right? Um, if, if, if we're going to be distracted by their expression rather than doing our expression, okay? Said another way, if we're called to a teaching ministry, we need to build some close relationships with other people who are also called to teaching ministry so we can work together to teach. Or if we're called to um, inner healing ministry, we need to make sure that some of our close relationships are also called to healing ministry, the inner healing ministry. Otherwise, we won't be doing too much inner healing ministry. We'll be too distracted by either we're going to try to force them into our ministry or they'll try to force us into their ministry because that's their assignment. Why would they not be interested and passionate about their assignment? So we must make sure that some of our relationships carry the same expression, okay? If we're called to intercessory prayer, we better make sure that some of our relationships are also called to intercessory prayer. Otherwise, we're not going to be doing too much praying, right? We're going to be doing whatever their interests are. See, so it's important that we commit to uh, ensure that some of our relationships share a common expression of God's assignments, okay? And, and, and I guess the last thing here is just that we got to commit to working together for the sake of God's assignments. Um, we can't, we can't, we can't. Adam said, it's not good for, God, for Adam to be alone. He can't fulfill his assignments alone. He needs some helpers, okay? We can't fulfill our assignments alone. No matter what you're called to do in this world, you can't do it alone, okay? That's the whole point of Genesis chapter 2. Adam couldn't do it alone. We can't do it alone, okay? So God made Adam a helper, the first of many, to help him fulfill his assignments, okay? But that requires that we learn how to work together, right? Um, we got to be completely, we've got to completely resist the temptation to hold a grudge, to completely resist the temptation to be offended, to take up an offense, to embrace a wound. We have to say no because we have assignments that are world-changing. We have assignments that, 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 that the world is waiting for us to fulfill. It is so critical that we do what we're called to do. So whenever there's a conflict, our greatest weapon has to be, and our first weapon, has to be forgiveness. Okay? Okay? We're not called to nurse a wound. We're called to heal a person. Wow, that was good, eh? <laughs> we, we, we end up feeding the wound. We're supposed to minister to the person, right? God's assignments will never be fulfilled if we continue to get offended or take up offenses or, uh, 
you know, get whatever. Just that old pride thing rises up, or that you know that selfish self will thing rises up. You know, for the sake of God's kingdom, for the sake of our uh, assignments, our memories should be short and our patience should be long. Right? H how dare we? I'm going to sound like that climate girl. I'm not going to, I don't want to do that. Okay, it would not be good. It would not be good. If we allowed petty arguments and petty misunderstandings and petty differences and petty personality differences to get in the way of us fulfilling God's assignments. And yet so often they do. Well, he offended me. He uh, didn't say hello to me today. And I just really was bothered why he didn't say, well, maybe he was, I don't know, just thinking. I, maybe, he was, maybe he had a head cold like I had last week. I don't know. But the point is, why are we letting that get in the way when we have such a high calling in God? We have such a high calling. Unity in the spirit is not some sort of nice goal to aim at. Unity of the spirit is absolutely essential if we're going to fulfill our assignments on the earth. Like, I'm, I'm not into complete sovereignty of God, meaning God orders every every minuscule step, okay? But maybe you're sitting beside the person you are because you have an assignment with them someday. And, and don't you dare get offended at them. Don't you dare take up an offense at them. Because that'll get in the way of you fulfilling God's assignment on the earth. Why don't, just, just try it. Yeah, look, yeah no, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi and Marilyn. <laughs> you're great. I love you. I really do love you. Let's just start to love each other and let's look, get our eyes above ourselves and onto the assignments of God. Now, that doesn't mean we neglect ourselves, right? We understand that. But let's make sure that we don't allow these little things to keep us from the assignments God's called us to. And like I said, the person beside you may be the person you need for the next expression of assignment God's calling you to. So how do we respond? How do we respond today to God's assignment? We're going to have the Lord's Supper in just a minute. But how do we respond? Well, number one, let's commit to God's assignments. Let's say, God, yes, I commit to, protect, to cultivating and protecting your church and your kingdom. Yes, and I commit. Actually, I think there. Let's commit to overcoming and advancing the kingdom in this world. Overcoming the world and advancing the kingdom in the world. Let's just commit to it. Okay, just... God, this is, if this is what you've created me for, I'm going to do it. But let's also commit to building empowering kingdom relationships so we can do it together because we're called to do it together. And let's commit to helping other people become successful in their assignments because even if I'm not interested in your expression of your assignment, I'm still called to encourage you in it. You know, there are certain, uh, certain people like, there, there's some extreme right brain people they are just so incredibly creative, I just can't even track with them. You know, it's just like, I just, but I can honor them, and I can pray for them, and I can encourage them. Oh, here's a good one. Hey, you know how much I love your poetry. There's not a poetic bone in my body, right? I, I can't rhyme. Well, you, well, anyway. You know, but, like, Louisa is such a wordsmith when it comes to expressing the truths of God's word through poetry, okay? I, I, I can't track with that but I can pray for and honor her and love her and encourage her and see her fulfill uh, God, God's assignment for her life. Okay. Um, that's what we're called to do. Even if it's not what I'm called to do, it's okay because I'm called to be fruitful and to help her be fruitful. Okay. Okay. And then number four, let's commit to unity for the sake of God's kingdom. You know, I, unfortunately the world today is trying to be united for the sake of being united. Let's be united. So let's throw out all our theology. Let's throw out all our convictions. Let's throw out all our morality. They're great. We're united. We're like a bunch of slugs sitting in the same cesspool, all thinking the same things, which is basically nothing. Right? Wow, I just said that, didn't I? Wow. <laughs> That's why I need a translator. They slow me down so I don't say stuff like that. I don't have a translator today. Yikes. But see, the point... Yeah. But see... We're not called to unity for the sake of unity. 
we're called to unity for the sake of God's purpose, right? And if we're going to fulfill God's purpose, we desperately need each other. And we need to humble ourselves enough that we'll admit to, to needing each other. <coughs> Let's stand to our feet. We're going to make a commitment, and we're going to then uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together, okay? Let's uh, um, put our hand on our heart. God, touch our hearts this afternoon. Lord, help us. You know, God, we, we make New Year's Eve resolutions, and they usually last at least a couple hours. But, God, this is a kingdom. This is about the kingdom. So, Lord, help us to commit to our two assignments. Help us to commit that in the church, in the kingdom, we will always cultivate. We will always protect. We will not be part of dividing. We will not be part of causing division. We will be part of causing healing and unity and, and, and protect the kingdom and protect the church at all costs. Help us in Jesus' name. And Lord, help us to fulfill our assignment, to commit to our assignment in the world, to overcome evil, to speak up even when it's not very popular, to advance the kingdom when we just feel like just vegging out, Lord God. Help us in everything we do, in word and deed, to advance your kingdom. And help us, God, to take the time, to take the time to develop some healthy kingdom relationships, some empowering kingdom relationships, people that we can encourage and empower to fulfill their assignments and hopefully them help us fulfill our assignments, God. But help us to see it's not just about us. It's about us together. Lord, help us to commit to, to helping other people fulfill their assignments, God. To always serve, not only to be fruitful, but to help others be fruitful. To serve what they're called to do. And for, Lord, help us to commit to unity, not for our sake, not for unity's sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. Help us to put unity for the sake of your kingdom above everything else. It's a big, tall order, God, but God, you've called us to it, and you've given us your Holy Spirit, the spirit of peace, the spirit of unity, so we can do it. Lord, you said keep, no, you said uh, to, to uh, Lord, you've already given us the unity of the Spirit. You didn't say make the unity, you said keep the unity. We already have it. Thank you. In Christ, we have the unity. Lord, help us to keep the unity you've already given us because of your grace and mercy. Yes, Lord. Just, we're just going to take a minute, Lord, work in our hearts. Just work in our hearts right now. We're going to work, just work in our hearts right now. <clears throat> Lord, we need a new baptism of love today. We need a new baptism of grace, a new baptism of forgiveness and mercy this afternoon that we can do what you've called us to do. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God, that you created us in your image, in your likeness, that we can display your image and likeness on this earth today. And we do that for your glory and for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. 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 Just have a seat for just a minute. And uh, sure. <laughs> We're going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And, you know, there's so many, it's, it's like a, it's a never-ending, unfolding book of Revelation, all the things the Lord did for us in his body and blood. But obviously after this message, how important it is to remember that there's, we're called to one body to be united together for his glory. Um, said he shed his blood that to make the two into one new man. That together we are one. We're already one. We need to recognize our oneness. right? Just recognize what God's already done.